So, um, idea today is to recap a little bit what we were doing. So, we went into last time facing the defense of having non executable stack, non executable people, non executable whatever. Right? But it's, for a very long time, it sounded like an awesome defense. It's like, oh yeah, can't, uh, can't hack this system because you can't intermingle data and code. Right? Except, what we did instead was to kind of trick the program into executing pre existing code. And a sequence that we determined. Yes. What was the sequence that we came up with? Remember what we were doing? Anyone? Yeah? On top right. Pop up right was a part of it. What were we trying to accomplish? Send the user ID and then calling the shell code yes. the system. We're calling the system. Why couldn't we just call the system directly? The shell code after all. Because then we weren't root. Yeah, so drop privileges. Set the ID to zero, but yes. then you can't put in zero because then there's right. no bytes. And there's right. So we have to fix our code as we as we went. So we did a bunch of, of cool things like that. So let me just recap the method, just in case I just to bring it in, because this is a very important piece of technology in the next community. Turn oriented programming. So the situation is that we've talked about a number of countermeasures. We talked about this um, DAP or uh, Data execution prevention, which is uh, to prevent code injection from being executable. So we talked about this, and this is the method we used to overcome. We also talked about ASLR <coughs> randomization. Maybe remember what we normally do um, against the randomization. There's a number of techniques of differing kind of quality. So one of them is to Guess multiple times because it's not too much randomization. The other other one is to try to fill up the entire memory with shellcode or, or things that could be good so that you increase your probability of jumping at the right spot. It's called heap spray. Uh, good. Okay. And then the third one is to actually find the second bug. So if you find an exploit, you find an exploitation program and say it's Chrome or something like that, you find the second bug that reveals something about how things are laid out. Why would that be useful? <coughs> Let's suppose somebody leaves one pointer to you. How much information do you think that is? Is there anyone out there? <laughs> Somebody's in the movie. <laughs> Anyone? One pointer, right? So remember that when a program executes, the randomization happens on the fly, when it's put it off, when the computer puts up. What, what's the uh, what's the deal? And why? Still nothing. Does it happen when it's compiled? Well, no, it's actually, it doesn't have to compile. It's um, on Linux, you just want to just first run, right? So I start a service. All my things are randomized, even if I use the uh, special uh, pi position independent execution stuff. Everything's randomized at the beginning. And then this thing starts. Suppose it's something like Apache, web server, like that, and you have everything in memory. Now that server wants to do something, right? It wants to accept connections from afar, it wants to like, Create a thread pool so it can like serve all the web pages for nine gag or whatever it is that you guys watch. Um, and uh, when it does so, it calls clone or fork, right, to create new processes. And what is clone and fork? What do they really do? You're at some point in your program. You've done a bunch of stuff. Now you want to kind of like meiosis yourself or whatever. I don't know what the verb is. In. Well, you want to like create two copies of yourself with all the same information, right? If you call clone, you'd actually like this information to be so that if you change in one place, it also changes in, in the other. But in fork, you want it to be the case that everything is identical until you start changing it, or writing to it, in which case you actually, it looks like you have a, a new process. But because of this, we can't just, when we call fork, re-randomize everything. Because we, we have pointers in place, and we have data structures, and we have things. So when I start Apache from scratch, 
it will randomize the addresses, and then every single connection attempt to a proxy is going to have the same set of addresses. So it's going to be randomized only at the very beginning when the computer spawns up the first time the proxy runs. On Windows, it's even worse. Everything at the very beginning when you load Windows is randomized, and then that's it, right? So even if you restart IIS or whatever, you're going to have the same set of addresses. So that means that if you leak one pointer, you already know something about the segment that that pointer lies on. So if you have one pointer that uh, I shouldn't really bring my charges in there, um, leak one pointer of something that's on the heap, for instance, you will have a good idea of what's on the heap. So we use this information disclosure box to kind of chart what the computer layout is like, and then we can be like, oh yeah, this pointer is normally at this location in my program, and on their computer it was at that location, well, I'll just look at the difference, and now I know exactly where the heap segment starts, and therefore I can know exactly where my, my uh, code that I'm going to reuse is going to lie. Right? So that's all you, all you need, it's one pointer. And oh boy, are there a lot of information disclosure bugs. Get a little bit of this information, you can debug your information back, or you're able to somehow get format identifier back and get the pointer, all sorts of stuff like that. It's really cool. But I'm also finding two bugs now instead of one. So it does actually make things harder. Remember, in general in security, we're never striving for perfect security because that's an unattainable goal. We're trying to just make it harder or actually not worth it for the attacker to make progress. You can never stop somebody who's determined enough to get in. So this is something that successfully makes it harder to overcome uh, or, and to work on the program. Now we also have something called ASCII Armory. Anybody remember what this was about? Like making sure that you have a null byte within the address? Yeah, so you map the libraries at null byte addresses. Because at least in Linux, that's a bane of shell codes, right? Because we're attacking string functions within C, and they all stop at the first null byte. So if you have to copy an address, then uh, uh, you're making it hard to read. Now there's a vulnerability around that because we have our program linkage table and our global office table that are there to make sure that we can actually jump into any library. We dynamically load the library. Those addresses never have null bytes. And so if the function is used in the program, we can jump to it directly. So it's big faster. Huh? Um, okay, so this is what we had. This is the situation. Um, and then we talked about return to libz attack, right? So the idea here being that, well, maybe we can reuse some of these library calls. And then we went even further and said, maybe we can reuse parts of these library calls that just have a very long chain of return addresses on the stack. And each of them does a little bit more for our nefarious purposes, right? Within all the ethical bounds that we've all agreed to. Yes, good. Um, <coughs> so, ROP, um, we're going to talk about this. So, ROP works as follows. And what we're going to do today is so we're going to take this idea that we did last time of calling SatuID and the pop-up and so forth. We're going to take it to its kind of extreme conclusion. We're going to make an entire shell code from scratch without reusing anything that calls systems like that. We're just going to do it from ground up, just to show you the versatility of this, of this approach. Okay? Ready? Cool. So here we have pop and uh, this was the uh, previously. Um, so we can lift this stuff, and this is kind of cool. So this is our target. This is what we want to achieve. You remember when we were making shell codes from scratch? We were trying to do what? Yeah, so we were trying to get the, the we are trying to talk to the kernel, right? We are trying to tell the kernel, hey, load up this thing over here, bin sh, right? We we're trying to bypass the entire set of libraries that have this convoluted way of talking to the kernel. We just want to talk to the kernel directly by using a system call. So let's try to do that from, from scratch. And the system call that we wanted to do was called execd. Remember this? It's just to execute the program. What execd actually does within uh, the kernel is that it loads up a file, and then it takes your image and it just like Squashes everything that's in it and like puts the new memory stuff of the uh, of the program that's supposed to be in it and then changes the pointer and then you're a new program, right? 
You're back for the, you know, they take all your guts out and they put new ones in and then they let you go, right? That's what exit really does in a slightly dramatic fashion. Okay? So this is our goal. Get these values into the registers and then execute interrupt 80, or call sysenter, 64 bit build. Now let's have a think. Suppose you're now attacking a program from the get go, and this is what you need to get. What kinds of gadgets are you looking for? What kinds of short code followed by RAT will you need? But then you need to have it be, oh, okay. Before it fades away. Um, you're going to need to find an instruction that looks kind of like move L, EAX 11, <laughs> return, right? So in some sense, you're trying to find a function that is trying to return the number 11, which doesn't have like the most ubiquitous thing, right? So probably it's not going to be that direct. It's just going to be like, oh, we can take one at a time, and smooth it, and it's perfect, right? We're going to need to do some roundabout ways. We've got some roundabout ways of finding this. So let's have a look at what's going on here. Of course, this would be the first thing. Like, can we find mobile OXP, which is 11, AX, and that's easier. And uh, yeah, we're not going to find that. Here, we're using a rock gadget from last time. We say, like, hey, so rock gadget, we're looking at this vulnerable file over here. We're looking for the instruction move OXP, AX, and then we're looking for rect. And it tells you, like, yeah, dream on, buddy. Right? So instead, maybe instead of trying to like find exactly what we're looking for, let's see what we have and think about them as little kind of Lego pieces that we can put together. Okay? So here is a, here's something that exists in the program. That's for AIXDX. What does this accomplish? It clears the AX, yeah. Okay, so now we can clear the AX. That's not going to be good enough for us, is it? But it is something. Of course, we don't get any partial credit as a hacker. Be like, no, almost hacked your machine, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to go all the way. So let's see what else is in here. Oh, now here's a very short instruction, OX40, to increase the CAX. Huh. And that exists in the program as well. So we can increase EAX uh, by one. Uh, now what do we do? Yeah. Yes, why not? Because we can, right? <laughs> yes. So we just <laughs> have this beautiful shell code over here, right? The fact that what's happening is that we're chaining together <coughs> actual EAX, right? Increase, right? Increase, right? Increase, and so forth, right? And, and we'll be good to go. Right? So now our shell code looks a little bit like this. We have our uh, straight after the buffer that we overloaded, we put in the actual rat gadget over here. And then we have our increase per rat, which is all the, at this location over here, but we have several pointers, we have 11 of them. Okay? All is well, right? So when this one executes, we're not here, and so forth. And by the end, we're good to go. So that's one register down the line. Let's look at the next one. So here's what the code actually would look like. You could type this curl code or you could try to write it in Python or something like that. Um, here it is executing. So this is something that's very helpful to you guys when you're debugging. So we shoved this in. Here's our input. We run the program. We put a breakpoint here in the vulnerable one. And uh, put in 140 A's just over at the uh, buffer, which was 136 like always. And then four extra bytes for Pointer, and then this is our first return address, XOR, and then it's just always the same stuff over here. And now we're just going to step through it. This is how you would do it. Display just tells you at every point of the way, every time I have a breakpoint or a stop execution, tell me what the instruction pointer is. It's very convenient this for kind of stepping. Now it's do step one instruction, step two, and so forth. So here's our XOR, RAT. And then we're into our increase in RAT, increase in RAT. We so happen to be kind of doing kind of Frankenstein here, STP copy, which I don't even know what it does, and some sort of MEM compare for special processors, SC4. So 
So if you're just borrowing code from wherever, right? Because we don't care. Yeah, it's all good. It's all fair. Cool. And then eventually you're going to get there. Of course, this gets unwieldy really fast. So doing the Python approach I took last time makes it a little bit easier to deal with. So this is the kind of code that I probably would expect you guys to make up. Is to say, like, hey, let's just um, have a little routine here called clear reacts, and all of this is return the instruction, uh, the pointer to the instruction for XRL, EX, EX, and the rest in the program. And then you have 148, so you put into a buffer, you add that address, you add 11 of these, and eventually you print this, and this becomes your argument for the program. Pretty slick, right? It's an exploit. It's cool, right? Hard weekend, huh? <laughs> oh, no, poor guy. I meant that sincerely, sorry. Poor guy. Um, next up, EGX. <coughs> Uh-oh. What do we need EGX to come from? Okay. Yes, well read. Good. Um, so I'm going to find an address of thin as eight. Now remember what we did last time? To find this? Hmm? Well, you well. MSF. MSF. Oh yeah, MSF uh, L scan. We just searched the entire binary for any string that looks like this. We found it somewhere. And it doesn't even matter where it is, right? We can even use the same kind of problem here. Yeah, we can use a oh, great idea, MSF health scan, uh, to find business in the Lo and behold, right here. So what happens if we put into our business? So hold on a second. We found this address here, but we want that address to be an EPX. How are we going to do that? We can't just put this as a return address, because then it's going to try to execute these as instructions. Plus, this is probably a data segment, which means that it's not executable, it's just going to crash all together. We have no protections. But then again, even if it could, it's going to try to look at these as being sort of weird assembly instructions that are going to crash them somehow. So somehow we need to get this address here into EBM. So how could we possibly do something like that? Operator DBS, yes, yes that's, that's exactly right. Does that make sense? So we have a pop EBX thread, and then we follow that up with <coughs> any other instruction. Well, actually, we follow it up with these four bytes and then the rest of our chain. We're in good shape, right? Ooh. I can hear my heart beating so quiet again. There's apparently a room somewhere which has such good insulation that you go in there and you can, you're really like drowned out by the uh, sound of your own heartbeat. And it's so eerie that people can only spend a limited amount of time in there. <laughs> it's like extremely quiet. Um, this is what that feels like, guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, okay, so let's try that. We want to do some sort of uh, <coughs> pop here. So pop EBX, we can look for, and we put in there, and then we just put the address right after it. The address of the actual business head string. And uh, <coughs> that was cool. So we have something effectively equivalent to a move into register operation for rock, right? Notice how we're kind of doing this weird roundabout programming. Now instead of us jumping, we call pop. Instead of us uh, moving stuff in the registers, we again like push it onto the stack and then pop it back. We have all these kind of weird operations that we can do. <coughs> but it's kind of neat that, that it works. OK. And now um, so I want to get to zero to EC. And oh, no. There's no actual ECX, ECX. Oh. What will we do? Yeah, what can we do? So, tell me. What should we do? I think there's even more than one solution here. So let's uh, find them both. 
Should I put on the trivia music or something? Daily Double. When you have EAX to zero, you have to XOR it with itself, right? Yeah, but mm -hmm. we didn't have that. We didn't have that? We didn't find an XOR ECX, ECX insert. No, no, EAX. Oh, we have EAX. Yeah, we put the zero, can't we just move it into ECX? Oh, so which one is that now here? One says move EAX, ECX. Well, uh, well, this one here, this is the address of ECX points two. Oh. And then it messes up your frame pointer. Okay. Well, actually, so here's the thing about pop EPP. What would happen if we call something like system or something like that after we mess up our frame pointer here? It's going to try to access arguments from 8 EPP and 12 EPP and so forth. So the frame pointer actually messed up. You can't send arguments into system calls anymore. Maybe you don't need to because you're just going to be stringing together these type of operations and you're fine. But just be aware of that. So yeah, so the idea was putting ECX into what e ECX points to, but that's uh, we don't have anything useful in ECX right now. We haven't touched it. So this is probably by and of itself not going to work. Any other ideas? Yeah. Can you move that random value to ECX and be incremented like a million times? This one over here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have the world's longest chill code. <laughs> yeah, weird kind of Guinness world record. Like yeah, it took many days. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, that is an approach. There have been exploits that are like that, where you have like actual progress bars. It's like, it seems that that's what they find for all these movies. Like, oh, it's jammed, ah, it's not happening. Okay. Any other takers? No? Yeah. For the stack pointer. Well, the thing is that you're kind of at the mercy of the stack pointer being correct because that's your next next instruction that you're going to run. So if you push your go back four bytes, and then like you have to make sure that the next thing you return to is the next thing on the stack. So if you push enough things, and then you push a return address that you like, that's going to deal with all the stuff you pushed, you're okay. It's like you're on this conveyor belt. USB. Can I use the four bytes? Um. Okay, so the pumps. Okay, so we pop EDX and ECX and EBX, everything's great. And then what? So somehow, yeah, push zero on the stack and then call this. The thing is that, think about how you would do that, right? So you would be trying to have, have an instruction do a lot of push stuff. <coughs> But then you need the next instruction pointer to be this thing over here that then pops them, right? So you have to be a little bit careful. Hmm. Well, what do we have? So this pair here is kind of interesting, right? If we were able to do something fun with EDX, we could maybe make use of that, right? Maybe that second one, we could say that what EDX points to can move into ECI. So if we put this into an address that's going to be somewhere that has a bunch of nulls, then that would be really sweet. But we haven't even begin, begun to look at what EDX can do. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to see here. So that if we search for just zeros, they're an ample supply, right? As you know, there's lots of zeros in the world. 
Um, so here are some examples of places that always have zeros. In. So what we're going to do, we're going to say, hey, let's put that address into EDX. And so when, when we searched for it was EDX, and we thought that there was a pop EDX operation. Ah, so we can directly move an address into EDX. And then we'll do our move what EDX points to is from four zeros into ECX. And ta-da, it'll be clear, right? Okay. okay, so that's the idea. So we're going to uh, uh, have our pop EDX, we're going to have our data that points to zeros, and we're going to move things to ECX. So now our, our nice little shellcode, or ROP set, is going to look like this. Clear EDX, increase it 11 times, so we're coming to EDX. Pop EBX. And then we put here just a pointer to where the shell is. So it's going to get point popped over here and then pretend to this guy over here. We're going to pop EBX, which is going to be the address that points to zero. And then return to this instruction over here that's going to move what EBX points to e to ECX. So now we're done? Or what's going to happen? Done. Before my screen fades away. If this is our exploit, what will happen? Nothing. Well, you, we just diligently set up a bunch of registers, so then we're like, take it from here. Right? Yeah. Right? We never gave the kernel any control. We just like got the mercy or whatever comes after this thing. Yeah. It's just definitely going to crash our program. So uh, yeah, it's like doing a perfect job and then just like leaving it without sending it in or something. Oh yeah, my homework it's, it's at home. I finished it. What about ETX? What's the situation with ETX here? So apparently in Las Vegas, they put extra oxygen into the air to make people feel a little bit high. <laughs> yeah. So among many other things they did. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'll disclose that. It was not in anything you signed. Yeah. Okay, so EDX is... Wait, 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 wait back here. So this is the environment pointer here. Um, the red line points to an address that has null, which actually might work, but it also just might crash because it's just the empty environment. Uh, so we could try it, but let's try to see around ETX. So we, we, the first thing we try is to see, can we just XOR it and be done? But then we realize that, of course, of course it's not that easy, right? So now we're faced with these guys. What do we do? So we're going to try to clear out ETX. So now I definitely want some theories about what we can do. Bring it on. One. I want zero on EDX. Wait, does the exchange put like put the input up like what's in EDX to into EDX and what's in EDX into EDX? Exactly. Like, can't you just do that before you increment to EDX? That is one of parts, exactly, yeah. So we were successfully able to zero at EAX, no problem, because we could just actually, right? So then we can just do that and then be done with ETX from the get-go. Well, actually, then we have the problem of we need to get something else into ETX, remember? The proofs were ECX. But is there some ordering of that that would make sense? Probably. How about we just start with that? Put the stuff we need into ECX by yeah, modifying ETX. Yes. Then do the AX, yeah. do the exchange, and then move zero into EAX again. Then we're done, right? That's one approach. Is there another approach that can, people can see? Yeah. Increment it by one. Beautiful. Yeah, exactly right. So move minus one effectively over here into EDX. Pop something in the APP, nobody cares. And then uh, increase it by one. Where's the increase? Up there at the very top. So second line. 
Christian belonging and the two. The two approaches. You can look at both if you like. In one case, um, here we have our set here, um, and we modified it. We haven't modified it at all, actually. We just put here at the end something like this. Move minus one to dx, pop something that's just adding, doesn't matter, to EDP. And then we increase it by one, and now our the registers are set up. And then the other one, we have to rearrange things a little bit. And the rearrangement looks as this. Um, we pop stuff into EDX. First thing we do. What is it? Well, it is our absolute zeros. We move all that stuff into ECX, and now we're done with ECX. Now we're going to clear out the AX, exchange the AX and EDX, so that now EDX is The answer to all my questions are going to be zero or something like that. Um, and then, or yes. Uh, and then there's, we clear out DAX again. So it's actually the same guys that are here. Increase it by one, increase it by two, oh, like increase it again and again until, this, <coughs> until we reach 11. Like spiral down. Right? Um, and then we pop EBX, which is our same thing, and then we're done, right? Ta-da! Will this work? Yes. Yes? Oh, okay, I lied. The answer to most of my questions are going to be no. <laughs> it's called Bedford's Law of Headlines. Have you heard this? If there's a question in the headline, the answer is no. Yeah, I think it's okay. Okay. Um, we need to actually execute something, right? So we need the power safety. That's easy. We have to search for this happening anywhere where it's executable. And it's only in like two bytes, so CD, OX80. And that can be within any structure and whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as we end on that note, we'll be good to go. And then, of course, here's our full exploit, like what it looks like. So we have just like little functions for each of the addresses that we need. Or you can make a little hash map or whatever you want. But really, like the exploit is just carefully kind of gluing together these little Let's see if we can actually find. So, of course, like if you if you run it, of course it works because this is a slide. On slides, everything works the first time, right? It's called the slideware, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, I was just going to show you. Maybe you can look at some recent exploit. Uh, so there's this uh, place here. Uh, let's find something here. Uh, it's called exploitdb.com. Oh, it looks like I've been there before. Funny. And let's just find some of the 35,000 exploits that they have against, um, yeah, well, what do you guys want? Some Windows stuff or mm -hmm. shell codes, papers, web applications, probably not going to be good. Remote exploit, let's just search. Search for or not. Any, uh, any ideas? Let's do Explorer. Internet Explorer. Because that's, that's never had any bugs in it. Use after free. That sounds great. Let's see if we can have an uh, actual exploit code over here. I just wanted to show you that this is the technique that people are using today, right? Okay, what's happening here? This is, uh, okay, this is just a proof of concept. Is that an exploit? Well, it's fun and all, but it has an actual exploit. Remote application shell exploit. 2004? Oh, that wasn't what I wanted. I'm just showing something recent. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, find something at home um, and show it to you guys, so that you can see real exploits. But anyway, I mean, now you can actually look inside some of these exploits. This is like where, where you can uh, find some of the recent things that are uh, from malware campaigns and so forth. And you can see how the actual exploit works. So if we, uh, if we just look at <coughs> Look at what's inside of it here. Oh, here we go. Here's the shell code. So we start to understand the things here. Now, why is the shell code written so 
Punky over here. The U is actually Unicode. You remember Windows works in kind of this two character to us. A lot of things Unicode. Which also means that you'll have uh, zeros in here, no problem. Do you see zeros? And then they got rid of the zeros. So, yeah. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. There's some standard shift over here. Here, they're putting a bunch of stuff up here. They're actually putting up a whole bunch of 750 shell codes all over. And they're doing this within the JavaScript coder here. Let's see if we can find the actual. Uh, Raw chain. There's no raw chain. There's no raw chain needed, it seems like. Okay, well. Um, oh, okay, maybe maybe this is in here. Shellcode is this. Okay. No, no, this is the shellcode over here. Okay, so this is not one that's, that's too interesting. It's probably too old because raw hadn't been really invented at that time. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll find some exposure and can show you that this is, a, this is the technique that I was using. Of course, you don't just believe me, but I won't expose this. Um, anyway, so um, some advanced techniques you can use the raw to uh, to abuse the uh, PLT addresses. You can even leak PLT addresses. Um, you can find some uh, using PLT. If there's something that's loaded, like string copy or something like that. You can find the internal offset from there to, uh, say, XFD or system. Or like that. You can find where in the library it has to be. Because in the library, string copy and XFD are going to be X offset apart. So if you look at the PLT address and follow it, you can actually uh, figure it out. So in some sense, you can have uh, uh, you can have a rock chain that determines, it's like a, it finds the thing that's looking for and then pushes down to stuff. You can make arbitrarily complex functions here. And then, of course, there's the information disclosure stuff, looking at state, linking with printf, and so forth. So that's raw. Any questions about return oriented program? Mm -hmm. Any comments on return oriented program? This is really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Fine. Fine. Okay, I'll try something else. Um, how about integer overflows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Here's something here. Okay. So, we've talked now a lot about how we exploit bugs. Let's talk a little bit more about how they come to be. The only way we've really seen new exploits get created is because somebody messes up like string copies. But that can't be what's always happening. You can't have that many bugs sitting. It's not like every single person is just doomed to have this one string copy value, right? So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's unexpected that uh, that creates these types of vulnerabilities. So let's look at integer bugs. And these are the class of bugs that have been found in pretty much every critical software. It's been found in Chrome, it's been found in OpenSSH, Apache had a really bad one, the Linux kernel has had hundreds, so maybe it's like a trove of Exploits. All the integer stuff is, is bogus in there. Opera, Internet Explorer, of course, Mac OS X, remote exploits. And they're hard to spot sometimes, which is why they're so ubiquitous. So we'll actually talk about several classes of this. And this will actually go a little bit into what is the C standard and how is it compiled and so forth. So we're going to be covering uh, signed uh, integer boundaries. So, like if you overrun something or underflow it. And also, the same thing with unsigned, which is uh, actually subtly different. And um, we'll also talk about what happens when you're converting between types. Because you're, whether you know it or not, you're often moving from an unsigned to a signed without really implicitly doing it, or explicitly doing it. It's all implicit. So things get truncated and extended and so forth. So let's look a little bit at what, um, what this is about. So you remember uh, two's complements, right? You remember why numbers are designed the way they are in our computers. We talked about this very briefly, right? In particular, we talked about the notion that we shouldn't have two zeros, like a zero and a minus zero, because that makes no sense, right? So instead, what we do is that we have effectively one bit at the very beginning here, the most significant bit, that says, hey, this number is actually negative. But then the way we look at the rest of the digits is how? 
Like if I were to make a formula that says, here, I give you the spin strings and you have to tell me what the value it is, what would your formula look like? Suppose we just look at let's see, we just look at the positive numbers. Then the formula is just really go from right to left, have some sort of counter that keeps multiplying itself by two, so we're looking at parts of two. If the bit is set, so if it's a one here, we add one. If the next one sets, we add two to it, and we add four to it. As long as we have ones, we're going to add this number to it. Remember, we had this function to display, right? What's that? Um, yes, yes, yes. So, for negative numbers, what do we do? So, how do we represent the number minus one? Yes, you can look at the slide. It's all ones, right? Yeah, we just used it before. What was that? It's just all ones, right? So, the formula for just adding a parcel two is clearly not going to work for negative numbers. So how does it work for negative numbers? Flip the bits and add one. That's right. Flip the bits and add one. Okay. And by doing that, this adding of one means that we have one more negative number than we do positive numbers. Okay. So the positive numbers have to include zero as one of them. So it goes up to 127 in this case here. The negative numbers would go from 1 to minus 128, which has peculiarities like the one we talked about, I think, two classes ago, where if I take the minus of this number over here, I get but that minus and then minus 128, it will become, if I flip all the bits, it becomes 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and I add 1. becomes itself. Those types of idiosyncrasies are really confusing to programmers. And we love confusing stuff as I right? love things that are unintuitive. Now of course overflow means that we exceeded our maximum value. Everything has a bounded fixed range. So if I go beyond the 127, what will happen? If I add 1 to 127 in there, what number will it represent? It's a giant ring. So we'll go back to oops. If I exceed the maximum number here, I go to the smallest positive whole number I can represent. So I move from 127 to minus 128. Ooh. Because we just missed the kind of carry bit that we can represent. So an overflow is when we move in that direction. If we go in the other direction, we move from like we keep uh, subtracting from the small numbers, then we'll actually end up with a really big positive number. It's an underflow. Cool. So let's have a look at um, what happens. Suppose I have an unsent char. How many, how many bytes are in a char? Single character is. One, one byte, yes, exactly. Um, which means that it can represent numbers between, if it's unsigned, it can represent numbers between, if it's unsigned, we're actually not going from minus 128 to 127, we're going from zero, because there's no signed bit, that's what unsigned means, right? We go from zero to, 255. yeah, to 55, that's what we can represent, both included. Okay? Which means that if I take some big number here, I add two months to it, it's just going to wrap around. The number here, 260, can't be represented in a range between 0 and 255, so the whole number is going to become. The lower point here, 4. We we'll just lose that initial bit. Right? Or here, if I have the number 0 and I have an unset char and I subtract 1 from it, I get the number. Two fifty-five. 
This is odd, right? At best, it's odd. At worst, it's confusing, right? Or dangerous. This is a standard. Let me reach out of the C99 standard. A computation involving unsend operands can never overflow because the result that can be represented by the resulting unsend integer type is reduced modulo the number that's one greater than the largest value of the characteristic. Right? You read this, of course, you fall asleep. Nobody reads. But this is what it says. It says that actually this is not a bug. It's just supposed to wrap around. Like an integer is supposed to be on the ring of integers modulo one greater than the largest number second represent. So it's a feature that if I take one and I add it to a or 32 bit integer, I am implicitly saying modulo two to the 32, and it's supposed to become zero. Right? You're not supposed to give me a warning that this happens. Yay! Fun, huh? That's for unsend numbers, right? So, um, hold on a second, we just did that. So here's, a, here's something for you guys to, to be challenged at. This is an actual code from OpenSSH. You guys know what SSH is, right? So if you have a bug in an OpenSSH server, you can walk into half of this planet, right? Because most people have the SSH port open. If I can go in there and I can have a remote exploit, you own that computer. It's amazing if you find bugs in this. Of course, this is one of the most scrutinized pieces of software in history. Here's a bug from it. And tell me, what is the bug? And um, since we're doing something that involves you guys, we're going to have music. OK, any takers? What, what music are we having? Um, let's do YouTube. Do I dare open YouTube? Uh, and we want to find infected mushroom. There we go. Okay. There we go. Something like this. Okay, so, find the bug. Looks like, right? You're gonna, you have to, it, it's supposed to be saying, like, hey, um, you're going to have to read it this many responses, right? And you tell it, you, this is the number you have to read it, okay? And it's, it makes sure that, like, oh, yeah, I need to make sure I have enough memory to read and everything. Oh, so, it's so what's the part? You can allocate zero memory. How do you do that? But if you, if you print this as zero, then this is going to become zero, but this is also never going to happen. So don't read it. What? Oh, how do you do the overflow? Malloc expect, right? So two digits simply won't bind, right? This but isn't it. Once you get there, right? If you put in 256? Well, we're putting in the get in, right? The package. Yeah, yeah. So you get back the number 256, which fits amply within the 32-bit bit that we have here. And now you're going to say, like, oh, 256 times what size of character pointer? How big is this on 32-bit uh, architectures? Four bytes. Right? There's four bytes, so we're going to 256 times four, which is. That's right. That's a 24. And we're going to go then we'll do all our 256 things that come in, and we're going to read them in. Right? Nothing bad has happened so far, right? Okay. So we're saying, but we want to allocate zero. That's what you're saying? Well, 
we'd like we like a hack. Hack program, please. Yes. Okay. Oh, Max Minzer. Okay, how much is that for Max Minzer? Divided by what, sorry? Oh, yes, then what happens here? Yeah, because here it's like, suppose you put a number 2 to the 30, something like that, right? Then you multiply it by 4, so you get the number 2 to 32, which you can't even represent, becomes. Become zero, right? And actually, XMLEC is going to happily give you uh, a chunk of length zero. Why would it do that? And then you're going to be writing two to the 30 responses all over. You're going to be like slamming memory. You all get nothing, and now you're overwriting. And the thing is that this is on the heap, and we haven't talked about stuff on the heap yet, but there are some really cool things that you can overwrite there. So let me open the next class. Right? Um, but anyway, this is a massive, massive over and happens here because you can't take a number that goes all the way up to 232 and then multiply for something and expect it to fit into something it expects at most 232. Ah, cool, huh? So, this is, um, there's also uh, another thing that comes up, which is that, um, according to the and then I, the implementation kind of decides on what happens with signed integers. Is it an overflow or not? Uh, it's up to you. And it's wonderful to have standards that are so loose that you have no idea what's correct. So you just, yeah, you just do whatever. So most commonly, there's a well-defined way of dealing with overflows, right? And it kind of comes from, uh, it, it depends on how your processor is implemented. So let's have a look here. Let's look at a, just a typical x86 architecture. So here's a little number, and this is the biggest what number? 7, f of f of is the biggest which kind of number. We have a signed integer, so it's the biggest signed positive number that we could represent. If we do one more, we will have the top bit set and the number is massively negative, right? This is the number 2 to the 31 minus 1, okay? And if we just print it out here as the decimal string, we're going to print out only 2.147, 2 billion, roughly. And if I add 1 to it, uh-oh. Ooh. 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 So that's what happens on x architectures. It's kind of exactly like the ring before, right? So I think for subtraction, if I have a very low negative number over here, and I subtract something from it, boom, <coughs> huge. So, here's another one. Sign in zero or overflow. Find me the bug. When you see these program codes, first thing to look for is what do you control? <laughs> Socket key is probably going to be something internal to the program when it opened up the socket and accepted your connection. It's its own file descriptor that it uses to talk to that network connection. So you read from it, and whatever you read from it, that's from some, some external user. But that's the itself internal. In particular, here we're reading stuff from the socket key into a buffer. This is probably from the wrong user, which is connected. There seem to be all these links checks in place here, right? Network get int from socket D. You're getting an integer from the remote user, which sounds like something that should be this issue, right? And then it's an integer, signed integer. But we do all these checks, right? Look at the checks. Aren't they beautiful? 
check if it's negative, in which case they're like, yeah, not going to happen. Or we check if, if we add one, plus, one to it, is it greater than max cars, which is probably the size of the buffer we're reading into. Uh, oh, yeah, so this is the buffer we're reading into here. And then if, if we survive this, then we start reading. But obviously, we checked every case, right? If we put uh, the biggest positive integer that. Ooh, what happens then? The length plus one would not be greater or equal to length. Okay, what happened? So let's, let's look at this. This is a very interesting idea here. I'm going to open up Notepad here for fun. Okay, so we're here. This is our program. And we're putting in the number. What is the biggest positive? number something like this right mm -hmm. okay so what happens here in the first test it checks hey is this giant positive number is it uh, less than zero no mm -hmm. -uh. right and then it's gonna go here and say like hey is this number plus one greater or equal to max cars mm -hmm. now what is this number here Yeah, this is the smallest negative number, right? The biggest thing number, putting on your vector. And it's asking, like, is this gigantic uh, negative number, is that greater than, uh, than some positive quantity? Uh-uh. Ooh, so we just take out the boundary there, right? So they, how would you fix this? Yeah, or you could try to do some explicit casting to make sure that you could make this unsigned. Also, right? That would do it. Right? So there's a number of ways you could do it, and many of them are incorrect. But yeah, you could not have the plus one over there. You could make the whole thing unsigned. You could cast things around so the comparison is always done correctly. For instance, you could. Uh, Put here zero ul to make it unsigned, and then the other one has to be cast into an unsigned. So you actually be doing the right comparison. Cool stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that's not going to be very useful because it's the check will be optimized out. Yeah, it's actually tricky to fix the stuff, and we'll have a whole lecture on that. So then, what happens is that we're not going to read from buffer up to like two gigabytes of memory into this giant little wimpy buffer that didn't know what's coming, right? Um, and then we'll overwrite something else and return it. And of course, we've over, overloaded everything that's right here. So here's the actual solution. So I'm going to have one here, passes the check because this is positive, and then passes the other check because adding one to it actually keeps the negative, and then we raise two gates. Okay. Now we're going to talk about um, some other stuff that happens with uh, integers. This is called widening. Okay. So remember that. We're dealing with this type sort of one bytes and two bytes and four bytes and so forth. Sometimes we're casting between these. And when we are, we sometimes widen the number, right? If we move from one byte to two bytes, I have to fill in those extra eight bits that I just got. Right? And you're probably familiar with this from your assembly course. And also because you paid such extravagant attention during our assembly lecture at the beginning of the beginning of the semester, you remember that we have sign extension. Remember this? I have an unsigned value, and I want to move it from being a one-byte type to a two-byte type. It's unsigned. What do I need to do? What are my extra eight bits going to look like? So we're going to be all zero. Put zero extension. Because unsigned, yeah, I mean, there was no negative value to begin with. Didn't have to do anything. But if I have a signed number, I have to check the frontmost signed bit, see if it was negative before. If it was negative, I have to carry those ones onwards. So I fill it up with eight ones at the very beginning. Ah, let's go with that. So, anyway. so for example, so here's some examples. Here's um, an unsigned character five being moved onto a signed int. Well, source type is unsigned, therefore it's a zero extension. I fill it with zeros, easy piece. And we preserve the value. Signed character. From minus five to an integer. Well, now we're gonna have to look. We actually saw the source type is signed, so we have to do sign extension. Sign extension looks at the frontmost bit. In this case here, it was what was it? It was set, so this number is negative. So we're gonna keep 
all those extra bits that we're putting at the, as a prefix to this number, we're going to have them be ones. So it's all one, 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 and then the number comes. This means that now it retains its own value. The value is preserved, right? Because I just widen the time. Well, um, yeah, this might be surprising to some programmers, but we love surprising. Okay? We'll look at that again. Now here's another one. What about if we go the other direction? Uh oh. That's called narrowing. So suppose I have an int here and have the value <coughs> minus one million, which looks like this in hex. And I move it now to an unsigned short, which is a 16-bit type. What will happen? We're actually just gonna drop drop all this extra information that it just goes away. Because there's no way for us to be able to preserve value. We're just we're hoping that the programmer just made sure that they were just using the two bytes over there and the, and those were what we retained. So this value here, minus one million, ends up being forty eight thousand five seventy six. Huh. Word. All right. Now then there's the really uh, tricky part. Which is when you move from a signed type to an unsigned type, or the other way around. Because what are you going to do? If you have negative numbers, do you get rid of them? Do you uh, round them up? Probably not. You, you have to do something. And it may be that when you're moving, you're also doing widening and narrowing. You have to be very careful to, to see that you can retain or preserve the original value of the numbers or not. So we have to have some rules in place about how we do this conversion so that we have the highest chance of retaining what the user intended. Does this make sense? So for instance here, if I move from an int here, it's just a value minus one, and I want to cast it into an unsend int, well, obviously there's not much I can do. I have to just view these four bytes here as being unsend, and now minus one becomes four billion. There's not much I can do. So in this case here, it's just completely retained. Or if I go the other way around, from an unsigned int to 4 billion to an int, well, now the 4 billion has the value minus 1. That's not much we can do. We just keep the bit parent. Conversions happen either explicitly. You say, hey, I want to look at this character here, this x here. I want, to, I want it to be an unsigned character. So you're explicit about it, right? So for, uh, sometimes it's a little bit more. Uh, Elaborate. So if you're here, for instance, if you have a short int a, and then we have another b over here, which is a assigned integer, and we do cast it. We say, hey, b, uh, it's now cast onto a, or it's set to say. So whenever we do this, there has to be a conversion that takes place, right? When I'm saying that there are conversions taking place, this is all happening at compile time, right? The compiler is saying, like, whenever stuff here, moves from here to here, I have to have all the instructions in place so that I know what ends up in A. It's not something that's happening dynamically at runtime. It's not checking like, oh, is the value 5 or minus 5? What should I do? It has no such liberty. It has to for it has to prescribe a rule for everything that's like, when I move B to A, they're going to look like this. This is what the bit pattern looks like. So there necessarily has to be some loss in some cases, like what we see. Okay? So here first is what happens. What does A become? Does it preserve its value? Well, in this case here, we truncate it because we're narrowing. When we truncate it, well, we're actually able to represent minus 10 and say a short, because short has a range of minus 32,000 to 32,000. Um, so we were able to retain the value. But yeah, in general, if there was a bigger value, we would have had lossy conversion here. What about here? There's some function f, facing an integer and an unsigned character b, and we're putting some numbers into it. We're putting in a short and an int. That's another conversion that needs to happen. We need to make sure that we match the arguments of the prototype of the function we're trying to call. So what happens here? What happens to x? Hmm? I heard whispers. What? 
volume up? Hmm? Yuxa Valley? Yeah, so what, what are the conversions that are happening? It moves from being a short to an int. So it is, what's, what's this called? Widening. Um, so it's widening, but there's a, is it value preserving? Yeah, I can rep represent every single short integer with an unsend integer because it's just a bigger data type. It still has all the same negative numbers and all that stuff. I'm not moving between side and unsend. I'm moving to a wider type. What about the other one? I, I moved int here into an unsend char. Now it's a lack of the draw, right? I'm representing these four billion numbers in a range that goes up to 256. So, Value not valid for something. Okay? Value should be shared. Y is narrowed. Value might change here. Okay. Uh, return value. Same thing. If I'm returning a character here, and uh, the thing that I'm returning is actually an internal variable as an integer, then again, we have to do some conversion. So in this case here, we have to narrow a down, and then we have to truncate it into a character. Right? And then there are things that seem a little bit more implicit, and this is where it gets really interesting, right? So if I want to add up the number a and b, or I want to XOR them, or any such arithmetic operation of a and b, well, they better be of the same type, right? I don't want to just add random stuff together, because I don't know what that's, that's going to end up being. So if I have a, a, a character and an integer, like, I'd like to get the character to be also an integer. Feel it, right? This just makes more sense. So this is called integer promotion. So what we're going to try to do is that we're going to, under all circumstances, promote things to integer if they are smaller than integers. Okay. So shorts and characters, they're all promoted. Okay. We have an int or a long, which is equivalent to 32 bits. There's no promotion. So the question that remains, do we move promote you to a, to a signed integer or an unsigned integer? And that's kind of tricky, right? So let's look at the, the rules here. So this is the uh, usual arithmetic relations that where this would happen. It's addition, subtraction, multiplication, all this different stuff, right? So the rules work as follows. And here's a flow chart that uh, we need to look at a little bit carefully. First question is like, hey, are we dealing with a floating point number? Like 2.5 or 3.14? If so, yeah, just we deal with it differently. Floating points, we don't really care. Otherwise, we're into this realm here of integer promotion. Mm -hmm. And the questions that are going to be asked, the if sentences that you're going to go through are the following. First off, are they the same type? Yeah, OK. We don't have to do anything. Yeah. We don't have to promote anything. We're just done. And then, uh oh, it's different times. So you get a little bit more stressed. Okay. Uh, same signedness? Are they both unsigned or both signed? If yeah, okay, so okay, let's take the one that's slightly narrower than the other and just extend it. And we'll be able to retain value, right? Cool, that would be really awesome, right? And then I'm like, oh no, oh, different signs too. Uh oh. Now we have to sort of make choices. What choice do we make? Is the unsigned type wider or the same width as the signed type? Now it's like you're filling out your tax form. Like, what's happening? The unsigned type is wider or the same width as the signed type. What is this? Let's think about what we could do here. Right? There's some signed type that has a range between, like, say, minus 127 and one, minus 128 and 127. And there's a, an unsigned type, but it's wider or possibly the same with, let's say it's an unsent int. So what would we like to, uh, like to do? Well, we have to make some choice here, because we are going to lose the negative values represented by the sign number. So we do so, we convert the signed number, the one that has this range, into the unsigned wider number. And then we just cast and hope for the best. It's not value preserving in all circumstances, but hope for the best. And if that's not the case, if it is the case that the ensign type is uh, smaller, it's like it's, it's narrower than the sign type, then there is a possibility still. The possibility is that 
And this is kind of the special case here, because we end up at the same place here, unless we have the special case. Special case is if we have a tiny range here, let's say 0 to 256 or 0 to 255, that fits inside a wider sign point, so from minus 32,000 to 32,000. If it can actually fit in there, then we're good. Because we can preserve the valley, right? Valley preservation happens right here. And otherwise, we're just royally screwed. And we're just going to decide that, like, well, let's take the signed one, convert it to the unsigned character, and just close our eyes, throw away the key, right? That's how it works. So I have examples of each of these, but we're out of time. But we'll start the next time. Um, please remember I have office hours tomorrow at 1.15 to 2, as well as on Wednesday. I expect to see some of you there. I uh, hope we see somebody there, because you will have to start this one very soon. It's not as easy as normal. It's fun though, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, good luck with that. See you on Wednesday.